living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far
said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus? And thou callest us up, call this, call it us out, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the cleaning of the graves of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Horeb and Z, and what I was able to do in comparison of you. Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. Now there's a bunch of stuff going on here. Uh, Orb and Zeb are the princes. Zeb and Zalmuna are the kings. Uh, don't name your kids that. You'll have a tough time. They'll, you'll, they'll get beaten up in school quite a bit. Verse 4 says, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him, faint, uh, with him comma, faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread and the people that follow me, for they be faint. And I'm pursuing after Zeb and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. So they, they want some food. They need some sustenance. So they can continue on fighting and pursuing after Zeb and Zalmunna. So they come to the, the people of Succoth. And the Bible says this in verse number uh, 6. And the prince of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeb and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread to thine army? These dudes are traveling all through pursuing in a fight in a battle. They're like, oh, do you actually have them here with you? Or did, did you catch them? Or, hey. We need some food, man. Don't look me through the, the end to greed, man. We, we ain't trying to get green stamps. We just want some food, man. Yeah. Seven. And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord had delivered Zeban Zalmun into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with thorns of the, of the wilderness with briars. Oh, you don't want to give me any food? I'll be back to see you in a little while. Mm -hmm. Did Jesus do that with a scourge when he went through the temple? <clears throat> and he went up thence to Penuel and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered him. Oh, this is going to be rough, man. And he spake also to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come again in peace, I'll break down this tower. <laughs> I, I, you know, if you see Gideon, give him something to eat. <laughs> me, and my, me and him on the street when we're preaching, give him five bucks, man, because he'll, he'll do something bad to you. Now, Zeb and Zalmunna were in Karkor, and their host with them, about 15,000 men, all uh, that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east, and their fellow, and 120,000 men that drew sword. Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Nova and Jogbaha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. And when Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued after them, took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, discomfited all the host. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up, and caught a young man of men of Succoth, inquired of him, and he described unto him the prince of Succoth, and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. And he came to the men of Succoth, and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmunna, with whom he did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands are the hands of Zeba and Zemil, now Zeba and Zalmunna now in thy hand, that we uh, we should give bread unto thy men that are weary. And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught them in the sun. Oh, I'm going to teach you a lesson with these thorns, man. That's the rod on the top of the refrigerator for the kids. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, and he beat down the tower of Penuel. In case you guys forgot Penuel, I'm going to take your towel and slew the men of the city. Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, so he's now going to Whittled down to the kings that he's been pursuing. What manner of men were they whom ye slew at table? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one, the ones they killed at Tabor, resembled the children of the king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay them. And he said unto Jethro, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not the sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna, and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. Father, thank you again for the morning. Pray your blessing upon this time we have. Thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. What a great reminder. Father, witnessing this morning in Sunday school, and what do we witness about? The blood that ransomed and redeemed us. Yes. Father, thank you for the blood of your son. Thank you that it's still as fresh today as it was when we were shed 
two thousand some odd years ago, and it's able to say it to the uttermost. Thank you, Father. That blood will carry us from the day you saved us all the way through for eternity. I can't even think about that. How powerful that blood is. When the blood of men is, is corrupt and sinful and just sickness laden, and your son's blood is sinless and pure and holy. And Father, thank you for it. We ask your blessing upon this time. The preaching of your word, please fill me the Spirit of God. Bring honor and glory to you. And Father, you might receive the honor, glory, and praise to your holy name. Thank you. We can call you Father. It is a blessing. We ask your, uh, your, your praise and your honor be lifted up today through the preaching and instruction of your word. In Christ's name. Amen. So I read all that just to hone down on one verse. <laughs> Amen. There was something really cool in that whole thing we just read. Where when Zeba and Zalmunna were confronted by Gideon. Gideon finally has the two that he's been pursuing with his 300 men all through the wilderness. And he finally gets the two that he's really wanted. All the, all that you've read about the 100,000 plus that were slain and 15,000 amazing. You read, he, he wanted those two. You know why he wanted those two? Because of what they had done to the sons of his mother, his, his brethren. But the question that was asked is, you know, what were those men like that you killed? What were those, what were those folks like that you slew, Ziba and Zalmunna? What a curious thing in the Old Testament that the answer is, they were just like you. They resemble the children of a king. Hmm. So you can guess what the question is this morning. Mm -hmm. Do you resemble a child of the king? Mm -hmm. You think, well, well, of course I do. There might be more to it than you think as we go through the scriptures this morning. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that as we have, you know, if you have kids in here, you understand that you get to see your best attributes in your children. You do. I'm not looking at Haley right now. But I mean, <laughs> you get to see either physical, behavioral, or if you, maybe there's some physical talent of athletically or arts or science. I mean, or you can throw a baseball or you can do something, not soccer, or something like that. I mean, you really have a really good talent where you can hit a ball or do, you know, stuff like that. It actually really means something. Um, but you you do pass down traits in your family, characteristics in your family, uh, ears, nose, eyes, things like that. They do get handed down from generation to generation. They might miss a little here and there, but you can typically tell who your kids are when you look at them. Uh, one of the things about Taylor and Haley, they're about they're a couple of years apart, uh, some, two and some change. Um, whenever people see Taylor and Haley, they usually say immediately, number one, your father must be horrific. No, no, no. They, they, they say this. They're like, number one, your sisters. But, boy, you look almost exactly like with a two and a half. Well, well, they should unless the milkman showed up one day. I mean, I don't know. There should be look like my kids. What a great question in the Old Testament. In a book where apostasy is running wild, what's the theme of the book of uh, Judges? What's the theme of the book of Judges this morning, folks? We preached on it a few, many months ago, actually not. There was no what in Israel. And every... Exactly. That's the way saved people act now. Mm. Saved people act just like God is not their king and God is not their father, and they don't have to do anything but get saved, and now I'm just going to go do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. No, I'm supposed to carry some family traits from my dad. Yeah. My heavenly father should live his life through me as I yield to him so that people should see Christ in me, the hope of glory. There should be something different about you and me. It's not the way you dress or the way you wear your hair. They ought to see the glorious gospel and salvation that God rescued you with through your life. You should resemble, and I should resemble, a child of the king. You sing songs about it. I'm a child of the king. Say, well, are you really? Well, yeah, you know, I know the day I can say, no, no, okay, that's great. You laid the foundation stone, you're saved. But now as we live our lives... How much really of my father do I exhibit in my life? Do I have his eyes? Do I have his mouth? Do I have his ears? Do I have what, what in my life really resembles my king? That's the question from the Old Testament. In a book where apostasy is just going off the book. And there's no king in Israel. Every man that was doing that was right in his own eyes. Well, we have a king. We should resemble our king. We should represent our king. Listen, folks, this world is not our home. We are pilgrims here. Our kingdom is going to come down one day when we get on that. Those are, well, I hate horses, man. I hope they got to get something else, like maybe a Prius or something. <laughs> and I, and I, I'm serious. Horses, I'm not doing it, man. But our king's going to be on a horse, and he's going to, king of kings, lord, is going to lead us down through the universe. He's going to set his foot down. He's going to slay all his enemies and set us. I can't wait for that day. Mm. But we're in the process of being like our king. Until that day that he says, come home to glory, and then let's come back. 
Look at the Bible says to me. Let's go. Let's go quick through this. <laughs> That's a joke. First Corinthians, First Corinthians fourteen. How should I represent, resemble specifically my King today? Look at the Bible says to me over in First Corinthians fourteen. <coughs> now, if there was ever a church that is not the model to follow, it's the Corinthian church. You know what's going on there. I don't have to bring up all the details of the the abuse of uh, spiritual gifts and not using them correctly and the abuse of the Holy Ghost and, you know, the pride and the arrogancy of I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas and is Christ divided and all those things going on and, and the man fornicating with his mom and they don't do the Lord's Supper right. I mean, it's a wreck. It's a wreck. Well, look at one of the root causes of that in 1 Corinthians 14. You say, oh, you're going to talk about tongues more, preacher? No, no, let's, let's get a little, little more under the surface than that. Verse 12 says, even so ye, for as much as ye are themselves the spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel this, the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. And, uh, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the alert say, Amen, at, the giving, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily, verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words in my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Mm -hmm. Brethren, be not children understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children. But in understanding, be men. First thing I'd like to say this morning is you ought to be a child when it comes to malice. Mm -hmm. If there was anybody that could lash out at their enemies, it would be Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about just with anger. You know what malice is? Malice is not just keying your neighbor's car because their dog barks all night. I have not done that, Jonathan. <laughs> it's just not keying it, but it's actually writing your name in it. <laughs> yeah. It's that intentional hurt that's motivated by some deep-seated hatred. It's not just, oh, I killed an ant. Let me squash him and pop his head off his longer body. And it's a carpenter ant, so he's going to really, he's going to pop. It's going to be awesome. It, there's, there's more to it than just doing the act. It's that, it's that deep, intense hatred motivation that's underlying that. It's not just like I'm angry at something. It's. There's something cooking underneath that really comes out. Now, if there was anybody that could vent like that, it would be Jesus Christ. The one who made everybody, the one who hung on a tree, watching them what they did to his father's house, being a den of thieves, uh, hanging on a cross, being spit upon, and all that stuff. If there's anybody that would come back and or even have malice while he was here, it's Jesus Christ. You know what? He has no malice. Do you, do you think about how many times God hears his name taken in vain on any given day? And you tell me you wouldn't look down at some point in time and go, you know what? I don't just want to kill him. I want to kill him so I kill him so I kill him. Mm -hmm. It's malice. But you know what he says in the middle of the church? You know what one of your greatest problems is besides being bitter and envious and all that stuff? You guys do things because you like to do them because you're malicious. You know, what, you know what children do? Children might get mad at each other and steal toys from, one, toys from one another. But honestly, they turn around and forget about it pretty quick after that. They don't think like, you know what? Hmm. I'm going to put dynamite under his Tonka toy. And when he picks that Tonka toy up, it's going to blow his hands off. And that's going to be... No, they're not thinking that. Like, okay, well, let's move on to the next thing down the road. There's no malicious intent behind it. You say, what's the big deal about that? We as children should not have malice one towards another. Are we always going to get along on everything? You better say yes right there. Don't be shaking your head. No, you better be. No. Well, of course we don't get along on everything. But to take it to the point where I never want to see your face again. I don't look forward to coming to church again. I, I, I'm not sitting near them. I'm not going to talk to them. I can't, you know, if I see their car in the parking lot, I'm out of here. Yeah. That's where it goes from, you know what? I have often my brother a little bit. It goes into malice. Yeah. Children don't typically have malice. You just got the first, the first exhortation right there. You know how you be, a, you know how you resemble a child of the king. Be ye children of malice. Don't let that heart get so cold and bitter towards lost and saved that you just you're so hateful. You'll never talk about the Lord. You'll never pray for him. You'll never. It just it's just malice. Well, folks, I know we we all deal with it, man. We all deal. With it. It's called driving a car on eighty four. <laughs> 
There was a clown yesterday. I mean, I'm sorry, a lost person needs Jesus. That's what clown means in the coin. Day. <laughs> we're going down to, to Southington, and we're, we're uh, Polly's driving, and uh, <laughs> this guy is on the left. First of all, you can see him. I'm, 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 I'm not used to being a passenger. This is going to shock you. I don't let her drive. It's not Acts 27. We don't let her drive. I, I'm like, why don't you let me drive? No, I'm, I'm driving. That's the way, just the way it's going to go. Yeah. yeah, this is the way it is, man. That's why Kenny came on a motorcycle once, and he's like, I'm driving this thing. <laughs> there ain't no room for a second passenger, man. But so this guy, we're driving. I'm looking in the mirror. I'm like, this guy's in the Paul's like, oh, yeah, this guy, you know, Paul's just all chill, man. He comes flying up, honestly. To in about 95, comes right up to our tail, goes around the vehicle, goes across us, and takes the Queen Street exit, and there's not more than a quarter mile between what we saw happening, and goes right across us and goes through the little triangle and makes it down the exit by, I don't know, five, six feet before smashing into the exit sign. I had some malice. I, just, I said, Polly, you follow him right now. <laughs> and we'll tell him about Jesus, but we're going to, that's after we're, that's, we'll tell him about Jesus after we're malicious to him. <laughs> but you're, I know we're laughing at a good time, but the reality is, you do get malicious at times. Mm -hmm. It's that intent in the heart where you just don't want to see somebody hurt, you want to see him hurt bad. Yeah. That's not my city. That's not my king. If anybody could have malice, it would be Jesus Christ. And yet, for some reason, he says, I'll keep listening to you as long as you want to keep confessing. I'll keep restoring fellowship as long as you want to keep restoring fellowship. You want to come back and walk in the light? I'm right here. I'm like a prodigal father. I'm waiting for you at the gate. You want to come back? I'm right there. No malice, son. No malice. <sighs> really? Yeah. That's one of the first resemblances of a king, a child of a king. No malice. I'll show, you, I'll show you something. You can go to Ephesians 4. I'm not talking about letting uh, letting sin thrive. You know that. You know I'm talking about sin in the camp. I, I, you understand I'm not talking about, you know, if we don't deal with sin or preach on sin here. You know better than that. I'm talking about just flat out having awe and hatred in that bubbling where you're like, honestly, you get so engulfed with it mm -hmm. that you don't sleep, yeah. you toss, you turn, and it just consumes you. I'm talking about saved people. I'm not talking about the lost people. I'm talking about us. Because I'm supposed to resemble a child of the king. Zeban Zalmunna said flat out, you know what? They were just like you. Gideon, they were just like you. I wonder if that's what the Lord would say if he asked one of my enemies. I'm just like you, Lord. That's why we hated them so much. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, Verse 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not, uh, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Either give place to the devil, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing, which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that was good the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you sealed the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, with all malice. And be kind one to another. Tender heart, forgiving one another, because God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Mm. This is hard coming on now. If you've ever had a fight with your wife, yes. oh, that's so quiet right there. <laughs> if you've ever had a fight with your wife, things will come out that you never meant to come out. I've done it to my wife, she's done it to me. And she remembers with detail everything I've ever done. It's like she has a 4K recording or 8K, whatever it is now. But at some point in time, you gotta let it go. I don't mean let it go like AA or gambles. I'm talking about you gotta let it go God's way. Because you know what it does to you? It destroys you. Because the focus of your life becomes what they've done. It's, it, he just told you, put away clamor and every malice, man. Get that malice out of your heart, man. Because it'll ruin you. It's that I don't just want to pull out one fingernail. I want to pull all out and then pull a poor ass in the finger. Mm -hmm. It's malice, man. One of the resemblances of my king as a child of the king is I should not have malice in my heart. That's a rough one, man. Can we talk about the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God now with baptisms? Wouldn't that be easier, man? <laughs> no, this, you know what? This stuff is what helps us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's what makes the other things more enjoyable in my life. Because it's the stuff that really eats you away. 
It's like a canker, man. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 while you're right here. Look how that worked out, Brother Ken. Can you believe that, man? Picking up tips from me right now, right? <laughs> no, oh, there's Paul. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 8. Number two. We'll, we'll get through these. We will. I know I keep saying it. We will. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on uh, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he let that captain captain gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first to the Lord first of the earth? He that descended is the same also ascended up far above all that they might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting and saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ. Those are three lessons like Brother Bird, you couldn't remember. Verse number 13, to be uh, I, I, I struggled the same ones. Uh, not like you, but I do start all the time. <laughs> Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, of the perfect man, of the measure of the full of the fullness of Christ, that we look at this, that we henceforth be no more children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind and dark, by the sight of men, kind of crap, and sword by the blind wind of the sea. The speaking of truth and love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head of even Christ, and when the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supply, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make it increase the body unto itself mm. in love. Yeah. I know our foundation is fixed on Jesus Christ. I know our foundation of Bible is fixed on the doctrines of that Bible. Eternal security, King James Bible inspired, preserved, and errant, premillennial preacher. I know, I understand all that stuff. But you know what's going to blow you away and get you tossed to and fro? It's just not simply getting along with one another. You say, well, that just sounds like, oh, no, 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 you got to be careful about this is because... When you see what happens is, I don't want you to be children tossed to and fro. We think the wind of doctrine is Jehovah's Witnesses. If I need to tell you folks sitting here right now that Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine is wrong, I've done a really poor job of teaching you. <laughs> or somebody else. Or if I have to tell you the Mormon's Bible or their book is wrong, I, we've really done a bad job of training you. It's the stuff where within the assembly, the doctrine that turns into sound doctrine, how we talk to one another, how we pray for one another, how we give, all that stuff. Folks, the, some of the people that I consider some strong Christians are no longer working in the ministry. What happened to them? Was it because they dropped the King James Bible? No. Was it because they stopped believing in eternal security? Nope. Did they start denying the deity of Jesus Christ? Something blew them away that was a lot more insidious than simply... Oh, you're using an ESV. Well, we know the ESV is wrong. No, it's you get carried to and fro. God told you, you know, when you take a child by the hand, you can pretty much guide them where they want to go. You can kind of pull them. I mean, we saw Benny last night, man, and Maddie just pull him. I mean, he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> he's just wherever he goes, man. But because a child goes where his parents go and usually take them by the hand or when they're young and all that stuff. Well, the picture is, don't be like that as a child of God. Don't get tossed to and fro with everything you hear and everything that goes along. Don't get moved about. Be stable on what you believe and who you believe. Right. And be stable when you edify the body of Christ. It's edified amongst itself in love. Mm -hmm. Listen, love makes me get all, I think, what was the word last night? Ookie. Ookie. <laughs> <laughs> ookie, which meant cookie, so we had another cookie. <laughs> I mean, you get all ookie. When you say love, but honestly, uh, love is part of the gig, man, amongst us. It is, man. You can't escape it. Uh, that's how men will know you're my disciples. If you have one toward another. Love one toward another. 1335 John. And right here he says, you need to be, a, <laughs> you can't be his children tossed to and fro. So one of the things that a child of the king is, don't get moved around with all this foolishness, man. Stay stable. Don't get moved when you hear political winds and all this other stuff. Right. Stick to the God that brought you and bought you through his blood. Mm -hmm. Don't get moved around with stuff. Look at the Bible says over Galatians. Don't, don't tell me it can't affect you. Would you guys say Barnabas is a pretty good Bible disciple? Do you know the, do you know the, man, the man that brought uh, Galatians 2? Do you know the man that brought the Apostle Paul in to the fold was Barnabas? You may not have the discipleship and training of Paul and what you have from Romans of Philemon if it wasn't for Barnabas. So I'd say Barnabas is a, is a he's a really good, the Bible says he's also an apostle in Acts 14, 14. He's actually a really good dude. Watch how what we just read in Ephesians about be not children tossed to and fro. Look what the Bible says in Galatians 2, 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood into the face because he was to be blamed. All right, Paul, the apostle of Gentiles, is going to blame one of the top three? Yep. 
Look what he's doing. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated. He said, oh, no, I'm not really having a pork sandwich right now or anything. Uh, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Look at this. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Peter's actions, Peter's confrontation, Peter's withdrawal, Peter's actions caused somebody else who was stable to be carried away up in it. When you fall away or you get tossed away or you get tossed to and fro, it affects other people around you. Don't tell me it doesn't. I've been at this for 35 years. Not preaching or passing along or what. No, I've been at this and I've been around for 35 years. You never affect just yourself. Your decisions, your sin, whatever happened, when you get swept up in this stuff, you create a little mini whirlwind, and when that mini whirlwind goes to the next house, what's that whirlwind do? It picks up that house and that house when it gets bigger. It, 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 that's, what it, that's how it works, man. I, I, I don't want to be a child tossed to and fro. I want to be stable in what I believe, who I believe, and I want to go live it because I know that if I don't, it's not just going to affect me, it's going to affect everybody else in my family. That doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes, but you can't get caught up and carried away with it. One of the resemblances of a king in this example is don't get tossed around by everything you hear. You know what? The king told me. The king said to me. I don't care what you guys have to say. Well, where'd you get your orders from? Well, the king said, do you remember that battle back with Joab? And uh, Joab has, uh, finds um, Absalom, and he's stuck in a tree. And one of the soldiers comes along and says to Joab, hey, Absalom's up in a tree. What does Joab say? Oh, well, let's go cut him down. Let's have a party. No, Joab's like, go, let's go like, stick him. What did the servant say, the other soldier say? The king told me, don't touch him. Hmm. So what's Joab do? Well, he's not going to listen to the king. He's going to go do what he wants. Because Joab has some dirt on the king about that sheep. So I'm going to go do what I want. I'm going to be tossed to and fro. Joab, you're the greatest general in Israel right at that time. What are you doing? Tossed to and fro. You know why? He got away from the words of the king. Not, not resembling a child of the king. Go on, man. Let's go back to, uh, not, not go back. Let's go to uh, Ephesians 5. We're in Ephesians a little bit this morning. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Verse number one says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, <laughs> and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. A Savior. I'm supposed to be a follower of God as dear children. They ought to know the God that I worship and follow. I ought not just to be. Christian on demand, I ought to be Christian all the time. Right. I ought to be a follower of God when I'm not around other people or when I'm around other people. Right. And what he what he says right here, go with me over to a, go with me to John 13. As a follower of God, you're going to be faced with some situations that you don't really like. And guess what? They're going to watch to see how you handle the situation. Look at John 13 with me. I'm supposed to follow God and have love for the bread. I know I mentioned it last time. And then the last point, but look what the Bible says to me, 31, 13, 31, John. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while, I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, you have loved one toward another. Go over me to Philippians 2. He only said over in Ephesians that as a child of God, I'm, I'm supposed to follow my God and have love for the brethren around me. Not fake love. Not, 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 not I'm just going to phony my way through it. No. You can say I love you to somebody without getting all bushy. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing wrong with a little bit of emotion. There's nothing wrong with tears, man. Nothing wrong with that stuff if they're real, not contrived. There's nothing wrong with having some tears, man. That song moved me. Absolutely did. Yeah. That's it's supposed to. Yeah. I'm not going to be moved. Okay. I shall, I shall, I shall not be moved. Yeah, and God will just move right past you because you have no heart at all. Right. I'm not saying emotions are the key. The word of God's the key, man. Yes. 
but God ha allows for your emotions as long as you're tuned up by that book. But I'm supposed to, f I, as dear children, follow God and love one another. That's how they know. You know what? They should see us on the street together, laughing and talking to one another. Mm -hmm. They should see us bowing together in prayer and walk by and go, people still do that? Mm -hmm. Who are they praying to? I'm following my God as a dear child. Mm -hmm. And I'm loving the brethren who I'm out there with. It's pretty cool, man. It's tough to witness to somebody that you hate, man. Mm -hmm. This is wild stuff, man. Philippians chapter number 2, the Bible says with me in verse number 12. 212 of Philippians, wherefore my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both the will to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Have you tried to erase that one out of your Bible? Well, <laughs> <clears throat> do all things without murmurings and disputings, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of the crooked and perverse nation among whom he shines lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So that coupled with John 13, 35 and Ephesians 5, where we're at in this point is they ought to, as a, as a resemblance of my king, I should love the brethren and I should follow what he says to do. Mm -hmm. And then I should do it without murmuring and complaining. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever been caught by a lost person while you're complaining about it raining on your parade or your cookout, or you're murmuring and griping in your driveway because something didn't go your way or something and they catch it, they're, then the next time you go to witness, I guarantee they remember that, though they might not say it. If he's really following his God and really loves the brethren, why do I hear him chewing up the brethren like I do? Do you chew up the brethren on other people? Do you say that, yeah, church would be good except for the people? I know we were kidding about it last night. It is tough. It is tough, man. Uh, people are horrific. If it wasn't for eternity, I'd be a chainsaw murderer. I know I would. Or maybe a saza hold a dull blade. That'd be no. That's malice. See, there we go. Just destroyed the first point right there. Man. But I mean, part of the work of the ministry, part of it being, is, is you know what? We should not be ragging on one another in front of everybody else. If we got grievances, we work, we work them out here. We don't work them out out there. So the lost people go. They're following God. And they even can't, they can't get along with each other. They're arguing, you know, window gets smashed, man, blood goes through the door. <laughs> arguing about, something. come on, man. Brethren are not, not so to be. That's part of the resemblance of a child of the king is that I follow God and I have to get along with the brethren. Again, it's not that we like the same colors or the same foods and all that stuff. It's, you know what? We serve the same God, the same book. Yeah. It's part of resembling... Ziba and Zalmuna said, "Great to get in." Those people we killed before we killed them, we took no. They were just like you. Well, would to God that would be the way it was. Now I know in our in our world, I saw guys that came out of Bible calls that were exact cookie cutters. That's not what I'm talking about. This Bible makes rugged individuals with a common thread. Mm -hmm. It's the way it works, man. It's not this, let me stamp out a perfect clone. No, I don't want you. I don't, honestly, I don't want you to be like me. And your wives don't want you to be like me. Right, Kenny? <laughs> See, amen. amen. See, there you go, man. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> looks like we're twinsies, so we... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's part of the like, Follow the Lord, man. Obey what he says to do. Look what the Bible says. It's going to dovetail right there. So 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. This is the one that always gets a lot of, a lot of good, good positive, positive feedback in the uh, comment section. You know who else they, how I'm supposed to resemble my king, resemble the child of the king? The obedience that leads to a holy life. 1 Peter chapter 1 says this, verse 13. 1 Peter 1, 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you, the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children. Not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Go with 
for me to 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Please, 1 Thessalonians 2. Do we not say, and rightfully so from the King James Bible, that we are ambassadors for Christ? Mm -hmm. So what if, if, if I, as an ambassador of America, am in Beirut? Do I, do I take Beirut's doctrinal and their constitute, doctrine of the Constitution as their teaching? No, I'm representing my country in a foreign land. That's what you and I do when you're saved. I'm representing a foreign land and a foreign king that has an interest in this place. Yeah. The souls of men. Yeah. That's my representation. That's what I'm supposed to resemble. I'm not flying a, a Lebanese flag. I'm flying an American flag in foreign soil. I'm planting my flag in a foreign place. Yes. Because I am going home one day. And I want to resemble a child of the king. Not a child of my former father, the devil. Well, part of this is obedience that leads to a holy life. Not Baptist rules. It's obedience that leads you to be, leads you to be separate and holy and clean from the rest of the world you got saved out of. Look what the Bible says to me on 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Verse number 1 says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had, uh, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God would try our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor our cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, nor uh, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have in part unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own soul, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for labor and night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preach unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, oh boy, as a father to his children, that you want worthy of God, but called you unto his kingdom and glory. You and I are not supposed to think and act like this world, nor talk like the world, nor, nor adopt the world's philosophies about anything. I'm supposed to have a holy and just and unblameable testimony because you know why? That's what my king had down here and my father did. And Paul said, you know what? We didn't just preach the gospel to you. We lived the gospel in front of you so that you could never point your finger at us and say, gotcha, gotcha. Folks, they're going to try and blame you. you Jesus Christ, they tried to blame. Yeah. But none of the accusations stuck. Blame less, less the blame. The blame's going to come. It doesn't stick to me because I'm not guilty of it. And God knows that too. What did the Apostle Paul say in Acts 24? I, 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 I've lived in good conscience in the state. I've lived to have a conscience void of offense before God and man. you got to do the best you can because you know what? Whether you realize it or not, they're watching you. And you're supposed to resemble a child of the king. And part of that is living an obedient life that causes you to have a holy life. Let me ask you, you guys, you guys remember Daniel? Remember Daniel over in Daniel chapter 1? Mm -hmm. What did he and his captivity buddies decide not to do? I, I, I'm not going to eat what you guys eat. We're not going to drink what you guys drink. And 10 days later, what did the people of Babylon say? Mm -hmm. You're not like us. Your God must not be like our gods. And then it goes on to say he had favor way above the magicians and astrologers and everybody in that foreign land. You know why? Because they obeyed what God said to do and they lived a holy separated life and Babylon said they didn't eat our food. We, we, could, we couldn't change them. We couldn't shake them. And they look better than our people. Why? Because they obeyed God. We're not giving in to the king's meat. We're going to eat what our king told us to eat. We're going to do what our king told us to do. And I'll tell you in 10 days, you won't believe the difference between us 
who resemble the king and you who follow that king, Nebuchadnezzar. There should be a difference between the king's kids and their king's kids. Mm -hmm. It's obedience to them. Leads to a holy life. 100%. You're going to mess up in front of them. Be quick to make amends with it. Ask them for forgiveness. That's going to take humility. But they're going to see that hopefully more than the act that you did in front of them. You can't, folks, you can't live as a hermit, man. Uh, Brother Paul was telling me he was at, they were at the grocery store last, uh, last uh, Sunday night, was it, Paul? Mm -hmm. And he had, he had a suit on. And somebody, uh, a guy asked him, are you a witness? Are you a witness? Now, I know what that means. So are you really, you know, are you, you know, selling watchtowers? And Paul said, yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he, he noticed him. He had a suit. You say, what's that big guy? I'm not saying walk around in a suit. No, I'm going scuba diving. I'm a Baptist preacher. You pull off your scuba gear, and you got a three-piece suit on. <laughs> yeah. I'm golfing. I have shorts, but I need to see my, come on, man. That's what I thought. But he saw it and said, wow, he's got a suit on a Sunday night. Is he a witness? Right or wrong, they thought you were different because of the way you dressed. Mm. I'm not, we're not underneath the old tent. You know me better than that, man. I'm just saying it leads to, a, a, obedience leads to a holy life that's different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let my kids dress like whores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you let me just come out and say what's really on my heart? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you ought not to let your kids dress like whores if their daughters are look like, you know, the macho guy, like he's a cool guy. Yeah. Yeah, come on. exactly. If you're saved, yeah, I let your kids. You know what? If they get things at goodwill, big deal. Yeah. They won't look like a whore. Mm -hmm. That's three times I said whore. It just it feels good. It's just <laughs> kind of like jumping out of me right now. But that's what you're. That's what the world. The scary thing is, say people let their kids act and dress like that. Yeah. You know why? You don't resemble a child of the king. That's why. Yeah. You want to go back to the old king. Mm -hmm. You think the old king treated you better than the new king? Yeah. Okay. See the judgment scene. Right. Well, we don't all get settled there. You're threatening me. No, I know the terror of the Lord. rough stuff man it's not just clothing it's everything man we're not i understand we're not underneath any of the old testament dietary but i you know i know that but seriously when you start looking like the world man they figure you're part of the world then you yeah. say oh you're a christian really mm -hmm. don't tell me that has I've, I've got first hand experience that not with my kids but i've been around they're like I, she's a, she's a christian i said well i just want to give you gospel track and i, I know she, she's saved i wasn't trying to pack her i know she's saved and yeah. <laughs> I wasn't doing that to embarrass the person. I was just trying to give the, the kid a track. I said, yeah, she, she saved him. I mean, I don't know if she's ever told me about the Lord or not. And he's like, it does matter. But it starts with, I'm going to obey my king. And it leads to a holy, godly, separated life. Resemble a child can't go with me over to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, please. Matthew 18. I don't want to tell you how many there are because we live in ex expectation. <laughs> Matthew 18. That was funny. Come on now. Don't be getting all weird on me now. Matthew 18. For our should say weirder. Yeah. It's good stuff. Well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Love it, man. A hit dog a hall where somebody likes to say man. Somebody will go nameless. 18-1. Uh, 18-1. At the same time came the uh, Matthew 18-1. At the same time, came the disciples of Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him and sat in the midst of them, and said, Experially I say unto you, except you be converted, become as little children. Ye shall, uh, shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I understand exactly where we're at. I, I get it. I want to take the principle away. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child, my name receiveth me. But whoso shall, shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him than a millstone were hanged upon his neck, and that he were drowned in the death of the sea. Now that's cool. You ever had a run with a cat you didn't like? That's phenomenal biblical advice right there. Just saying. What I get from this personally, that I hope you will get from it, is you ought not to be easily offended. And you ought to have some humility about your life. It, it, I'm saying this because this, this kills me. Because I was told this weekend I'm a narcissist. Now, I don't believe I am. I'm egocentric. There's a difference. <laughs> but we all battle with pride. That, that, thing, that thing doesn't go away, man. Jesus Christ says, except you, Jesus Christ says, except you become as little children. 
and humble yourself like them. And if you offend one of these, you're in trouble. Well, number one, I don't want to be offended easily. We know Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love that lot. Nothing shall offend them. Mm -hmm. But also, pride goes before destruction. The Holy Spirit before fall. As a child of the King, I shall not be cocky and arrogant about things. I, that, I struggle with that, man. To this day, I still struggle with it. Even when I'm witnessing for the Lord, I take sometimes a superiority complex. Mm -hmm. They don't know. They're lost. I cannot look down my nose at them because that's where I was 38 years ago. Amen. Right. Laughing and scorning the same gospel, making fun of my brother who came back and told me that you need to be saved through Jesus. And right? Same spot. Yeah. But now, oh, look at me. I'm a, I'm, I know you're a child of the king, but there's humility. Folks, did not Jesus Christ the, make himself the meekest yes. when he could make everything with one word? You don't think he could have whooped everybody? He says, I can pray presently right now, and my father will send out more than 12 leaves. Uh, uh, I got the seat, you know, I just had 12 leaves of angels. One of them can kill 185,000 one night. Imagine six, 7,000 of those running around. That's the power that Jesus Christ had, but he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The one that has no business being humble. What would you do if he was arrogant or prideful? I don't appreciate your pride and arrogance. Let's <laughs> go spend some time down the lake of fire. What would you do? But he's not. So to resemble the child of the king, humility, like a little child, has to accompany my life. That is not easy, boy. That is not easy because you know who your old father was? The devil. You know what it says in Job 41, or the last verse? And behold, he, he, is, he is a king over all the children of that's his, that's, that's his gig. That's what Lucifer loves is pride. He loves it, boy. Even the life of a believer, he loves it because he sees an opening to get in there. You know, lines traveling a lot. That pack of lines is called pride. Gee, I wonder. You see it now with all the rainbow people. What's the one word they pick? Pride. God hates that boy. He resists the problem that gives grace to the home. Part of me resembling a child of the king. I should have some humility in my life. You know what's sad? It usually takes some breaking me through some crazy stuff. Like a pinhole in your brass fitting, man. <laughs> if you haven't seen that, I left it on, I left it with my wife. I brought it in on Wednesday night for everyone to see. It is the little fox that spoiled the mine. The water that went down through our ceiling all the way to the basement that destroyed our carpet. The Karen has to call on Wednesday and I'll get a quote for it. Yeah, man. A little pinhole. You say, well, yeah, that's all it takes, man. Mm -hmm. But you know why he does that? Because he wants to break that pride in you. Because mm -hmm. you're not resembling a child of his when that pride is up, like you've done something. That's why when you hear people will say, I, I understand what people say this. They give their testimony to others and they say, I got saved. Mm -hmm. I really try not to say that. The Lord saved me. Yeah. That'd be a better way of saying it. The Lord saved me 38 years ago. I know it rolls off the tongue, but even just showing how that comes out, who's trying to take preeminence? I got saved. Oh, you did. Like you had some play in it. I'm not talking about Calvinism, foolishness, fatalism, garbage. I'm saying, no, somebody brought you the word of God who God pricked their heart to do it. He probably had to reach you more than once. You finally listened to the conviction of the Spirit of God, and then you finally called upon him, and he was right there to answer you and say, what did you have to do with it? Just believe it. Well, you played a real big role. I got saved. You know, I it just ring, I got saved. No, the Lord saved me. When the Savior reached out his hand for me. Amen. He had nothing to do with that. It's part of being resembling a child. Can't go with me to John 20. Uh, John 21, excuse me. John 21. This one, uh, this one stings a little too, to be honest with you. Um, if we were to take a, a poll in here, how many of us think we really know what's going on in our lives? Who, how, how many of us think we're a little smarter than we really are? We have our genius, you already know that. <laughs> we have our genius, but that he's, that's a proven genius. Proven. He has a degree in geniosity. 
Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying, how many of us think that we really know what's best for our lives? If we were to take a poll, and I mean, if you're being honest for once in your life, how many of us think we really got it going on? We'd probably all, you know, you'd hand me down here. And, you, you would admit that you, you pretty much have a good control grasp of your life. You would. John 21, verse number one says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. That's pretty cool. On this wise is the exact same phrase in Matthew 1, 18, is how he was born, and here he is at the end. The Bible says this, and he's made unto his wisdom in 1 Corinthians 1. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of, Can uh, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. Simon Peter saith unto him, I go with fishing. <laughs> they say unto him, we also go with thee. See, Peter's not always the bad guy. Everybody thinks, oh, just Peter's just, yeah. no, he's just the, he's the tip of the spear man. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then said Jesus unto them, uh, check this out, <laughs> children, <laughs> have ye any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast it down the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw in for the multitude of fishes. I'd like to say this as we wind this thing down. You ought to listen to him. He knows just a little bit more about things than you do. Yeah. He's just a little more adept at life than you are. Mm -hmm. He knows more about your DNA, RNA, hair color, height, everything than you do. That means he's fully able to tell me what side of the boat to put the net on. Because the side I pick, without his counsel and advice, is going to be the wrong one. And the first thing he says is, children, have you any meat? Uh, no, no, Daddy, I've got it all by myself. Daddy, I don't know. Thank, uh, Daddy, I've got that. No, don't know. I, 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 I'll show you. I can do it. And the boy's probably just going. What? Uh, ha have you had fun fishing all night? You're feeding the, uh, you're feeding the lake with your worms. <laughs> Why don't you listen to me? Well, I mean, we're, we're commercial fishermen, and that's when you call it. So we know what we're doing, and we know how to mend our nets. And our father's seventy senior, and we, you know, I mean, we know what we're doing. I mean, I mean, Lord, I mean, what, what, what could possibly go wrong with us doing it our way? Children, um, throw it on the right side of the ship. Yeah, but Lord, we fit. I know more than you do about everything, and my counsel never. I never lie. I'll never cheat you. And I love you so much. You will never understand what you get on to heaven. And if you'll just do things my way, you'll have the greatest success you'll ever have in life. A child that resembles the king will take the advice he gives. Even though it doesn't seem like it's the right advice at the time. Because remember, the king's been there before. That's why I said at the beginning of that point is that how many of us really think we have it going on? We all do. We all think. And then the Lord says, Well, are you done slamming your head off of that cement uh, block? No, Lord, just a few more times. <laughs> uh, Lord, what's, what side was that? You told me that I got a concussion. <laughs> what side did would you go on the right side so you can stop beating your head up against the wall? I'd like to say that I've mastered that one, but I have not. First Thessalonians 5, last one. First Thessalonians 5. Children have any meat while it's just not real. Yeah. First Thessalonians 5. One of my, just a final little note on that. My favorite name for God is the Ancient of Days. I can just see him up in glory. The ain't, not ancient like he can't move, like he needs a walker or something. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he's got so much wisdom and understanding, and he's seen everything. There's nothing you're going to do that's different. There's nothing you're going to run by him that he hasn't heard. There's a, and yet I won't go to him and ask him what he thinks about things. I just want to put it on my side of the boat. 
children, would, would, just, would, would you act like a child for once and listen to what I'm saying? But dad, I want to go this way. You know, at some point in time, dad just says, okay, go, go that way. When you're, when you're probably, let's see, I'd say 18 to 25, people say the brain dead years are, you know, the teenage years, and okay. But for a man, I would say this, every man knows everything at 22. There's nothing you can tell a 22 year old man or 25 year old man. You really don't know anything until you're about 40, 45. And then the lights just start slowly coming on. But, but you try to tell somebody, a, a man at 22, 25 years old what to do, Ain't happened now. It's like my dad telling me, you would even hit 50, 55 years old, see what your body feels like. Ah, come on. Dad, you are 100 percent right. <laughs> Unbelievable. First lesson is fight. Dad, you're you know, dad, you're 100 percent right. Why did man listen to you? It's amazing how God's already told us that we have to have human examples to really illustrate when we have a more sure word prophecy. Five, mm. five, one. Five, one says this, but at the time of the season, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. For yourselves no further that the day of the Lord shall come up to Stephen the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then come, uh, then sudden destruction come upon them as to prevail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of nor of darkness. Mm -hmm. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be, uh, they that be drunken are drunk in the night. Whenever you ever have seen sleep, sleep, and that, that, and a few verses. Anyway, sorry, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an hell and hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort, that's your first Thessalonians 4, verse 18, you just saw, saw that earlier in the other chapter. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Now we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord's Amashu, and Amashu, and esteem very highly, and love for the works, they said, be at peace among yourselves. The Bible says this in verse number 5, you're children of light, children of the day, I should live in this whole context that goes from second coming back to the rapture. I should live in expectation that my father's coming for me at any time. Mm -hmm. That as somebody who wants to resemble a child of the king, I should be waiting for my father and my king to show up at any time. Mm -hmm. He said, well, the rapture might not happen for five, ten years. What happens if you die today? Mm -hmm. If you're saved, ask for the by present Lord, it's immediate. But are you, are you looking for your king to come get you? Are you, are, are, are you desirous to actually see the king show up in all his glory for you in the clouds? As Brother Kenny mentioned in Sunday school, or are you so trapped with what the word of God says, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and all those things. And before you know it, what started out as a little weed in your ground has now grown into a, a patch of dandelions who's now going to turn into a patch of thorns who's going to choke you. And the expectation of looking for the king gets dim, whereas the world's supposed to get strangely dim as I look for him. Mm -hmm. But the most safe people now have the reverse. The things of this world grow bright, and Jesus Christ coming back mm -hmm. grows dim, and they don't live their life like their king is coming for them. I'm living, and I want to live like my king's coming for me. I do mess up, 100%, and you do too. But Mess up and get up. Mm -hmm. And let's get back on the road for our Savior. Because he is coming for us. Mm -hmm. Whether by the trump or death. Mm -hmm. That's what... I'm supposed to stand on a street corner and look like a fool for my Savior. Because I know at any time, God might snatch me out of here. And that might be the last. And they're gonna, they're gospel, the gospel is going to change. And I want to be caught by him doing what's right for him. Right. Not doing what's wrong for him. Got plenty of that on the record. Right. But to resemble a child of the king, there should be an expectation that he's coming for me. That's what he just said. If you're children of the day, if you're children of light, you're not supposed to be children of darkness and looking. No, you're supposed to be looking for him. Mm -hmm. You know what? Because he's appointed us to wrath. We're out of here. Mm -hmm. Whether by death or by rapture. So just some things to consider this morning about traits and characteristics, resemblances of child of the king.
it's just some light and fluffy, you know, crazy just to keep you nice and jolly and happy this morning. Brother Kenny, pray for us, please, if you could, and we are, we are done for the morning. Thank you, Lord, that we are a child of the King. Thank you yeah, that we <clears throat> go out there and represent you, also be a witness for you, and um, just do things that take our pride down and by reading your word and giving us that uh, ammo so that we can give it out and just more honor and glory to you that you deserve it and you yeah. know uh, what side of the boat we should put that net on and I just pray that we would uh, follow after your word give heed to it pray about it most of all take counsel from you not this world because none, none in this world knows but you Lord you know us in our heart and what our true intention what we need to do and I just pray for that Give it to us in our hearts, and uh, just take it, take it all in. Just grab closer to you, in Jesus' name.